Uh, Nick Barker, welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks, Greg. Nice to be with you. Locked down as you are as well. So yeah, not much else to do, mate. Yeah, may as well chat about uh, music. May as well. <laughs> we, we are chatting because you've uh, just announced some uh, gigs with the Reptiles, Nick Barker and the Reptiles, uh, October yep. October 16, Bridge Hotel uh, Roselle, October 30, Corner Hotel Richmond. How long has it been since yep. you played with the Reptiles? Uh, we did a 30-year, I mean, God, you get all these, everything's an anniversary, I find, these days. But yeah. 1988, we released Another Me, which was our first singles. So the 30-year anniversary of that was about three years ago, and we did a did a show in Melbourne at the put at the uh, – What's called the Arabel Club, the Arabel RSL. We did a anniversary gig there for that, and it, it it went great. I hadn't, we hadn't sort of, we're not one of those bands that sort of reforms. And I mean, the funny thing about Reptiles is, we were a live band, we were a pub band. You know, we never had stacks of big hits. You know, so we kind of we we're, we're still kind of a fans band, if if you know what I mean. Like a lot of these other bands that have reformed and are doing these big gigs have, you know, it's wall to wall. I mean, I saw James Rain not long ago and, you know, it's wall to wall, you know, every single song, you know, like the, it's just, it's a killer fan show. Whereas Reptiles kind of, we've still got, it's more of a hardcore fan base. Like even though we were kind of around and we had, you know, obviously Make Me Smile was a big hit for us. We never really sold that many records in the context of, of that time. You know, where it's kind of people were selling three, four, five hundred thousand albums. Reptiles was sort of, you know, we, we never really cracked the the the, the seventy thousand mark, which sounds ridiculous now. But yeah. in those days, it was kind of, you know, that was the thing. So, my point is that while there's still a lot of people that bought our albums, they're still very much a hardcore fan group. Like they they know every single song rather than just the ones that are on the radio. So it's a little bit more nuanced than just putting back together a band that was sort of absolutely massive. You know what I mean? Yeah. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah. So when you think back at the, the late 80s, early 90s, what are your strongest memories? Well, I was saying to somebody the other day, I guess my strongest memories now in context, like, you know, we're kind of, you know, we're doing this show at the Bridge Hotel. You know, and we kind of, you know, you've got to be careful what you do around gigs now. Like you can't kind of do a gig somewhere else too close. Whereas I remember in Sydney, we, we, we could go, we used to do this regularly. We'd go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And all of those gigs would be within the Sydney area. You know, like there'd be a Wednesday night in, I don't know, North Ride and then Thursday be Carring Bush, then Friday be in the city, then you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you could really play and 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 on the way up you could play in Aubrey or you know, on the way from Sydney to Brisbane, you could play in Coffs Harbour and the Hoey Moe used to have gigs specifically on a Wednesday night because they knew bands would be going through there. And so I guess the you know it, for us to do like you know, we used to say we do a couple of hundred gigs in a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. It wasn't that much of a stretch to do that, whereas now you would be really, really pushing it. And, you know, I, I don't think it's either better or worse. Obviously, it's a lot, it would have been a lot better for, for the actual venues themselves, but it just made for a different type of band. Uh, you know, and Reptiles were, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, we were probably one of the last of the. I mean, you know, Screaming Jets and bands like that still tour hard now, you know. But I guess early 90s, a lot of the bigger, you know, the, the sort of the whole Seattle scene came through and there was big day outs and things did change a lot and people still toured. But I, I think that real hardcore touring circuits sort of started on the decline in the 90s. So, you know, I, it just we, we were just a great bar band, Reptiles, you know, I, I think. You know, we never really – bigger venues – we, we played, certainly doing supports and stuff, but we were always great in those, you know, mid-sized pubs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who, who were the other bands that inspired the Reptiles sound? Oh, 
Well, see, I, I'd sort of spent the 80s playing in post-punk bands in, in Melbourne. You know, I was a bass player. I played in bands like the Recory and, you know, tons and tons of bands in that Melbourne independent little band scene, you know. So I'd come out of a very arty, you know, quite a highbrow kind of music scene in a lot of ways, you know. Like, I mean, we're rubbing shoulders with the Bad Seeds and, you know, it was, it was amazing. Uh, but I guess reptiles, you know, like, I was always sort of just wanted to, you know, it was more, always supposed to be like a southern rock band, you know. I was always supposed to be like a kind of, you know, Georgia Satellites, Jason and the Scorchers type of thing, you know. It, it was never really meant to be anything more than that, you know. I mean, we had a harmonica player, for crying out loud. So, you know, Jay Giles, that kind of thing, you know. It was we just one of those big kind of jammy, sort of things that, that that I hadn't, you know, we just wanted it to be fun, you know. We are just, a, like, you know, we, we drank a lot of beer and we, and, and we just, we, we tried to make, we tried to play every show like it was our last, which is a real blues thing, right? You know, it's a very old tradition of kind of blues bar bands. And I guess we, were, we just wanted to do that, you know, so quite often detrimentally, you know. <laughs> You know, you got five gigs in a row and you've just played the Wednesday like it's like your last show ever. You're kind of behind the eight ball. But, you know, that was how we did it. And, you know, I've gotten a bit nostalgic about that recently. You know, I think probably lockdown had a bit to do to that. You know, you kind of had a lot of time on your hands to think and reminisce and wonder about where you sit within this sort of music scene and what your achievements have been. And, you know, I went through a period of... of you know, not being, I guess, not not being proud, but sort of, you know, like thinking, oh, I should have done things differently, but but not anymore. You know, I, I really, you know, that, I guess that's probably what led us to sort of maybe want to do a couple of shows anyway. You know, I'm probably rambling a bit, but you get the gist of what I'm saying, you know. Yeah, you, you played so many uh, venues around Australia. You, you must have played some uh, pretty interesting uh, or prepared in some pretty interesting band rooms. Uh, which, one, <laughs> which ones come to mind as being really interesting? Uh, I guess, I mean, gee whiz, you know, I mean, the band rooms aren't as glamorous as people think they are at all. Um, it's not so much the band rooms. The band rooms are all, I mean, most pubs are kind of just classic old pubs, whereas they've got, you know, well, they used to. It'd be like old sort of single men's quarters upstairs, right? So the band rooms are inevitably in just these little sort of rooms that would have been accommodation for people back in the day, you know. So they're all very similar in that regard. It's more just the kind of, you know, over the years, you know, what, what I've found more, more funny is the way that people, like you turn up to it. I used to take photos of them, but I don't know what's happened to them, but, you know, like... For instance, it, six warm beers sitting on a table with Nick Cave's writer written on it in texter on a piece of paper sitting on top of it for you. Or Dave Barker, Dave Barker's beer, do not touch, and just this type of stuff, you know. Or, you know, the bottle of vodka in the country pub that, that, that probably didn't even know what a bottle of vodka was back in the 80s, you know, and it's, there's this kind of bottle of vodka that no one knows the brand of that's covered in dust because it was on our rider from our agency or, you know, like just weird stuff like that. I mean, there was one time where it wasn't reptiles, but it was with Mick Thomas from Weddings Parties and anything. We drove from Perth to Geraldton. You know, it's a long way to drive. And we drove, and this was the day Bark story, actually. We we drove to, to the Geraldton Hotel and we were doing a, doing a show there and there was a big banner out the front that said, tonight, Mick Thomas from Weddings, Parties, Anything, and Dave Barker from Nick Barker and the Reptiles. So, I mean, you know, and you've just driven 12 hours or 10 hours or whatever it was, and you get there and you sort of, all the air just goes out of your sails. It's like, oh, you know, has it come to this? But, I mean, it, it, that's the sort of stuff I remember, just that, that kind of, you know, that, that, that sort of stuff rather than, you know, the lady walking into the bar going, 
For some reason, people always mistook me for Nick Cave. They get my names mixed up. I don't know. You know, you're playing in this little bar in the middle of nowhere and someone comes in and goes, what time's Nick Cave on? And you're sitting there going, you know. So I don't know. That's the sort of stuff I remember. You know? Yeah. Um, of course, you were uh, mushroom act, uh, part of the mushroom family. Indeed. Um, was indeed. You lost the great man, Mark Wignitsky, this year. Um, what are your memories? Yeah, of it was. Michael, and what did he do for the band? Well, Michael signed... Uh, obviously, we signed to Mushroom on his white label. Uh, but then Michael actually, well, I, and I've been on Mushroom Publishing since 1987, 88 to this day. So I've had a lot to do with my, Michael managed Reptiles, his management company managed Reptiles and managed me as a solo artist. So, oh, gee whiz, you know, I mean, not for him. You know, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. He, incredible supporter of, but a real fan. Like, you know, I can remember Michael, you know, like flying into Memphis when we were recording our second Reptiles album and just, you know, standing there in the recording studio with the, with the mixers cranking with a beer, just like fist pumping in the air, you know. It just, just childlike in his enthusiasm for music and it was, I don't know, like the, the influence he had on me, like a lot. Um, just, I don't know, just having someone like that being confident in you, was it was a real thing. Uh, you know, he was, uh, it's like the last picture show, Michael. You know, he was a real song and dance man within the industry. Like people like that don't exist anymore. Like it's, that's a, a real thing of an age, somebody who, was that kind of hands-on within that company, you know? It just, it was a real, it was, people, you know, use the term family, but it really was in Mushroom. And, you know, when I left Mushroom Records in 1997, when it was sort of getting sold on to, to Warners and stuff, it was a real, uh, it left a real hole in my life for a long time, you know, because I'd been there for 10 years. So, you know, and it was a great send-off for him down here. Like, he, he would have loved it, you know, lots of, lots of bands, lots of, Lots of guests, lot you know, Kylie and all that. He he would have adored it. So it was great to it was great to send him off like that. But yeah, hell, you know, it really it affected me a lot more than I thought. Really, to say goodbye to Michael. Yeah. Um. Let's talk about your, your gear, uh, your stage rig back in the day. And is it any different these days? A lot different. Gee, if I knew, if I knew then, what I know now, you know, I mean, I was kind of. I never really understood the value of low, low wattage amps, you know. So I used to try and play through Fender Twins and stuff because they were the sort of go-to higher amp, you know. And then I thought, oh, it's, it's not working for me. And I don't know why I never used Marshalls, you know. I was always sort of struggling with these kind of Fender combos running into quad boxes and stuff. And I, and I, I never ever use pedals. I never have, and I and I never really will live. You know, I've always relied on amp sound. So I used to get into terrible trouble trying to get that sort of natural distortion. So now, like for the last sort of fifteen years, I've been using kind of you know I've got a sort of seventies JMP Marshall heads, fifty watt heads, and I've got one now that's a seventy seven that's an absolute ball terror. And you know, then you know, some somewhere along in the process, I finally clicked with. 25 watt greenback speakers and I've I've never really looked back, you know. And my guitar sound now is so lens like the last reptiles gig we did, like it just everything makes sense now. Whereas before I listened to kind of live stuff and it was just it was never quite right, you know. <laughs> I was always wanting it to sound that that kind of faces he sound, but never got it, you know, that sort of early stones. I, you know, it's it's just that natural kind of seventies amp distortion sound. So now I kind of I break my quad boxes up into two. I got two twelves now because you know I just don't really use quad boxes that much anymore because they it's hard to find a venue where you can get away with using one. But so I I had all these really old. I had a quad box that I bought that was full of really 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 old greenbacks. Like, you know, they're probably worth sort of 700 bucks each. Like, and it was just a dumb luck that I bought this quad box and it was, it was full of these things. So I had them handmade into two, two, um, 212 cabinets and man, they just sound incredible. So, and I've still got the same guitar, same 
Fender Telecaster, 70s Telecaster, with a – it had a P90 in the front. This is how much I knew about guitars. It had a P90, you know, like a lot of people kind of put – Keith Richards style put a, a – you know, some – you know, a, a different – like a twin coil pickup or a, or a P90 – in the front of their tell in the front pick up of the tellies and um I didn't know what the P90 was so I just chucked it away <laughs> and got a uh like a give uh, like a you know a sort of PAF type similar Duncan put in it but I don't know what I got in there now but it sounds unreal but it's I got some sort of humbucker in there I can't remember what my crew guy at the time put it in but so it's exactly the same guitar and I only own one electric guitar and it's just served me so well, that Telecaster. I mean, it's had the neck snapped off it. It's, you know, it's been, it's been all around the world on its own in, in lost baggage. And it's just, it's part of my story and it's part of me. So that, that's the same guitar I use. And it just it sounds as good as it ever did. Yeah. Um, apart from the reptile shows, you've also uh, uh, performing End of the Line, the Travelling Wilburys tribute on July 2 at the Athenaeum. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, uh, it's this sort of, you know, it started with Tex Perkins, Man in Black. There's this narrated concert thing that, like, that, that, that Tex did in Man in Black, and it's become really popular. So there's been a Travelling Wilburys is in the tradition of that. It's sort of, it's when I say narrated concert, I mean, it's like you talk about the artist. So you're still doing the songs, but you're not kind of impersonating anybody. You're not. It's not just a cover gig. It's more like, you know, I'm going to tell you about Tom Petty and how he came to Travelling Wilburys and how Travelling Wilburys started. And someone else will talk about how George Harrison and how they met each other and just the genesis of it. I mean, the idea of it is to obviously still give people a blast from the past. But, you know, I always put it down in these terms is so they walk out of there knowing five more things about that favourite artist of theirs than they did before they went into that concert, you know, and they work really well because there's a lot of state-of-the-art kind of theatres around, especially in regional areas, you know, that are purpose-built for these sort of things. You know, we've been playing, we did a, we've done a bunch of those shows in, in rural areas, and, man, and they fill up with people and, and people just absolutely love it, you know. It's, it's really, they're really great fun, you know, and, and you kind of, doing something like Travelling Wilburys, my Godfather, you know, it's not an easy thing to do by any stretch of the imagination. Those songs, uh, like they're really, it's an, it was an incredible band. You know? yeah. I was never really much of a fan. I was a Tom Petty guy, you know, so it was really interesting for me to delve into that. Yeah. Um, so what are you most looking forward to about the reptile shows in October? Oh, it'd just be good to, you know, it's just good to blow off the cobwebs every now and again. You know, like I said, these reptiles, the reptiles are a bar band. It's all we were, all we ever wanted to be. And, you know, I guess somewhere along the line, we they tried to kind of, you know, everyone was looking for the next Guns N' Roses at that point in the late 80s, weren't they? So just looking forward to, to, to doing that, you know. I mean, the last show we did, we kind of, because we're getting older, I guess, we sort of, we play the stuff a lot slower and it works a lot better to me. You know, it, it's more of that kind of, sort of southern rock it sounds more southern rock than it ever did so we've kind of reworked some of the songs and just slowed them down a bit and they just a they're a bit more 12 bari sorry a bit of swagger yeah they just got a bit more groove and a bit more they just got a you know the, you're trying to play everything you know hell for leather it does it's obviously going to lose some of its feel so just giving them a bit of release on life so i'm just just getting up there and having a few beers and you know playing with a harmonic blues harp again you know, it's great fun. It's great fun. Well, Nick, people I, love it too. Yeah. Well, mate, it's been great to catch up and we look forward to seeing the shows. Likewise, man. Thanks for having me. No worries.